Evolutionists claim that creationism can make no real-world predictions. Well, it's time for them to eat their words, because physicist Russell Humphreys has given them exactly what they asked for with his prediction of the magnetic fields of the planets in the solar system using the assumption of a creation event less than 10,000 years ago. In 1984, while evolutionists were using the dynamo theory to make ultimately inaccurate predictions about each planet's magnetic field, Humphreys was making incredibly accurate predictions years and even decades ahead of time for the assumption that all planets in the solar system began as giant spheres of water. Being that water is a polar molecule, the magnetic field is predictable and so is its exponential decay. Humphreys merely calculated what the current magnetic field should be after 10,000 years. Using this assumption, he was able to make even more accurate predictions than NASA about the magnetic fields in all of the planets in our solar system. By 1990, Voyager 2 had confirmed his predictions as it passed Uranus and Neptune. In 2008 and 2011, his predictions were confirmed again as probes flew past Mercury and measured its magnetic field. The unproven, untestable dynamo theory just doesn't measure up. So why haven't these supposed scientists given up the ghost and accepted the science behind creationism? I had to investigate. In 1971, Thomas G. Barnes published a paper in the Creation Research Society Quarterly, a journal devoted specifically to peer review of creationist material titled Decay of the Earth's Magnetic Moment and the Geochronological Implications. In that paper, he cited the current decrease in the Earth's magnetic field as compiled by Keith MacDonald and Robert Gunz for the years 1835 through 1965. In subsequent papers, he built on his assertion that Earth's magnetic field is experiencing an exponentially increasing rate of decay and, based on that rate, projected that a maximum age of the planet could be no more than 10,000 years old and still support life. In episodes 34 and 62, I discussed this in great detail, showing how paleogeology of ocean floor sediments using magnetites recording the magnetic moment of rock formations correspond to wild fluctuations higher and lower than present in the planet's magnetic field, even going so far as to reverse itself in regular cycles over the vast ages of time. Also in episode 34, I discussed the dynamo theory, which explains these fluctuations and is the basis for NASA's predictions regarding magnetic fields. Even over short periods of time on the scale of hundreds or thousands of years, we can observe the fluctuations in the magnetic field by observing magnetites contained within kilns and pottery in archaeological sites. Not only do we find records of the change in direction of the magnetic field, but in the increase and decrease of the magnetic field over the past 2,000 years. As objects are heated, the magnetites contained within align themselves with the magnetic field at the time and, after cooling, record that moment for all time. And, in fact, the archaeological record going back 10 10,000 years shows us that the magnetic field has been significantly higher and lower in the past centuries over time, culminating with a current trend of decline that has only been recorded in artifacts over the past 170 years. The idea of a constant rate of exponential decay going back 10,000 years simply does not match with what we observe. McDonald and Gunst even mentioned these periodic increases in their work, but Barnes seems to have ignored that. In fact, even in the measurements that Barnes cited, while the overall result was a decrease from 8.558 times 10 to the 22nd amp meter squared to 8.017 times 10 to the 22nd amp meter squared between the years 1880 and 1885, there was an increase of 0.039. Between 1942 and 1945, there was another increase of 0.03. From the beginning of 1955 to the end of 1955, there was an increase of 0.03. This is far from the steady exponential decay that is claimed. Regardless of this, in 1983, over a decade before publishing his work on gravitational time dilation, Russell Humphreys built upon Barnes' ideas and had already published work that followed from his biblical conclusion that the planets formed from giant spheres of water. Like Barnes, Humphreys discarded all magnetic measurements but those from that 130-year period. Unlike Barnes, he went further to calculate a magnetic moment that would have been present at 2049 plus or minus 79 years ago, presumably to correspond to the birth of Jesus rather than the planet based only on the same 130 years of measurement. In Humphrey's scenario, the sun and all of the planets were initially created as spheres of water which was aligned in such a way that the protons in each helium atom within presented what is known as an accumulated dipole moment that produced a magnetic field of remarkable strength. From here, Humphreys claims that God transmuted the majority of the water in these spheres into the materials that make up each body in our solar system. It was at this point that the magnetic moment in each planet 
planet and the sun began their decay toward their present strength. Why the water was miraculously transmuted into Earth instead of simply creating planets with magnetic fields from the beginning is not explained, but Humphreys makes sure to remind us by citing scripture that the Bible states that the world was created from and by water. Also unlike Barnes, Humphreys accepts that there have been field reversals over Earth's history, one of which being at the birth of Jesus, which is a bit of a contradiction as field reversals involve severe reductions in the strength of the magnetic field followed by severe increases. It also renders exactly zero relevance to his model for the formation of the planet. Continuing Barnes' practice of avoiding the inconsistencies with archaeological magnetic measurements, however, Humphreys claims he used this model to predict the magnetic fields of the sun and the other planets in the solar system in his paper. The moon currently has no intrinsic magnetic field to speak of. Humphreys claims to have predicted that the moon once had a magnetic field, while the evolutionists claimed it never had one. The fact is that the Apollo 15 and 16 missions both returned to Earth with a plethora of mineral samples that indicated a past magnetic field. So NASA was well aware that the moon had once had a magnetic field over a decade before Humphrey's paper. What they didn't have was an explanation for why. While some scientists assumed that the moon had once had a dynamo, other scientists doubted that a dynamo could form in such a small body. At the time, moonquakes were common knowledge, but it was assumed they were the result of tidal forces between the Earth and the moon. Examination of seismic measurements from the Apollo missions eventually revealed that the moon does, in fact, have a solid inner core surrounded by a liquid outer core. These results were published on November 10, 2011 in the journal Nature in two separate papers by Christina Dwyer and a team led by Michael Labars. Even today, the elements of a dynamo are present in the moon, but being tidally locked, it can no longer function. When calculating the magnetic field of the sun, Humphreys acknowledges that the field cyclically reverses itself every 11 years, as observed as far back as 1953. He then claims that the sun must have had at least 500 reversals, which now takes us back to the proposed young Earth creation date. Contrary to his claim of prediction, however, he simply used the observed strength of the sun's field and then extrapolated that it had been reducing all that time from a magnetic moment that was 25% higher than today, arguing that a sustainable dynamo model should present an increase in field strength. As it turns out, in a study begun in 2017 by a team led by David Kuritz at Aberystwyth University showed that the sun's field had flares increasing the magnetic field by 10 times its previously observed strength. This was published in the March 29, 2019 issue of the Astrophysical Journal. Using his same erroneous schedule of strength reduction, Humphrey cited the observations of Mariner 10 as it flew by Mercury in 1970 and 1975. In 1984, he predicted a decrease of 1.8% would be observed in 1990. As there were no observations in 1990, in 2004, four years before Messenger did its first flyby of Mercury, Humphreys predicted that it would show a reduction of 4% in 2008. In 2008, he reported the 1974 to 75 observations at 4.8 times 10 to the 19 ampere square meters and the preliminary 2008 observations at 3.8 times 10 to the 19th ampere square meters. The first thing that should jump out at you is that his figures don't show a 4% decrease. They in fact show more than a 20% decrease, which according to his logic should put the creation of Mercury at 1500 years ago. What he didn't explain is the error bar involved. The actual measurements from the 70s had a degree of error of plus or minus 0.26 ampere square meters, while the preliminary measurements from Messenger's first flyby in 2008 had a degree of error of nearly plus or minus 1.5. While there were, in fact, blatant fluctuations in Mercury's magnetic field from location to location due to the offset of heavier elements within the planet, there actually was no significant change in the overall magnetic field. The full results, published in July 2008 by Brian Anderson, and his team in the journal Science concluded by stating, We find no evidence for a change in the planetary dipole since 1974 and also find that the planetary field is predominantly and possibly entirely dipolar. Due to Venus's almost non-existent rotation, scientists predicted that it should have little to no magnetic field. In 1962, the U.S. launched Mariner 2, which finally reached Venus and reported no significant magnetic field as predicted. What field is actually present is due to the solar wind colliding with Venus's ionosphere. Humphreys did not make any refutations in his paper other than to claim that his model explained it better than the dynamo theory, which predicted the results in the first place. Like the moon, Mars currently has no intrinsic magnetic magnetic field to speak of. And in similar fashion, Humphreys claims to have predicted that Mars once had a magnetic field while the evolutionists claimed it never had one. Once again, secular scientists already knew that Mars had once been magnetic, half a decade before Humphreys' paper was published due to the Viking 2 lander's measurements of magnetism in Mars rocks. Jupiter has an enormous magnetic field.
field that was first detected in 1955 but directly measured by Pioneer 10 in December of 1973, over a decade before Humphreys published his paper. Again, instead of a prediction, he merely asserts that his explanation is better. The problem is, the formula he used to determine the magnetic fields of the other planets gave a calculation that was far too small for what Jupiter's field actually is, so, for just this one planet, Humphreys multiplied his initial magnetic moment by four times. Saturn also has a large magnetic field that was first detected by the Pioneer 11 spacecraft in 1979 and then measured by the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft in 1980 and 81. Again, these measurements were made before Humphreys published his paper, so instead of a prediction, he asserted that his explanation was better. Uranus and Neptune both have significant magnetic fields that had never been measured at the time of his paper. These two are the only two predictions he made. Using the observed magnetic measurement for Earth's field of 7.9 times 10 to the 22nd ampere meters squared, and the observed measurement for Saturn's field of 4.3 times 10 to the 25th ampere meters squared, one should easily be able to estimate the dipole moments for Uranus and Neptune to be somewhere in the upper range of 10 to the 23rd or 10 to the 24th simply based on their comparative size or mass to Earth and Saturn. And in doing exactly that, Humphreys predicted a gigantic range for both of them on the order of 2 to 6 times 10 to the 24th ampere meters squared, offering no other rationale for those figures but then later widening that prediction to anywhere between 10 to the 23rd and 10 to the 25th. In other words, somewhere between Earth's and Saturn's field in a range spanning two full orders of magnitude. Way to state the obvious. In his 1990 paper, Humphreys claims that both his predictions and the secular predictions were correct for Neptune, but then goes on to say many evolutionists had predicted that Uranus would have a much smaller field or none at all. He then cites a January 1986 paper from the journal Nature by Andrew Dessler as the basis for this claim. In the actual paper, Dessler discusses a 1982 paper by John Clark which proposed a large magnetic field for Uranus based on what was perceived to be an aurora. Dessler's paper certainly refutes that the perceived aurora was in fact an aurora, but nowhere in his paper does he make a claim that there is no magnetic field. While there were scientists suggesting that Uranus may not have a significant magnetic field, this was not due to dynamic theory, but to the fact that, up to that point, Uranus had been silent in terms of radio transmission. Dessler's paper actually dismisses that notion as unfounded for several reasons, explaining the radio emissions might be beamed away from the spacecraft, the aural electrons may be too low in energy to support the excitation of radio emissions, there may not be enough background thermal plasma for the auroral beams to become unstable to radio frequency oscillations, the magnetic field of Uranus might be so strong that the radio emissions are above the senses of the Voyager radio receivers, the magnetosphere may be rather quiescent so that energetic particles that lose their energy through synchrotron radiation are not quickly replaced, and so forth. He then goes on to predict that Uranus would have a magnetic field at least as strong as Earth, but probably closer to 13 Gauss, or an order of magnitude around 10 to the 24th ampere meters squared. Four days later, the magnetic field of Uranus was measured at 3.0 times 10 to the 24th ampere meters squared. So in the end, most of what Humphreys calls predictions were made after the fact, thereby not being predictions at all. The predictions he actually did make were either wrong or so wide that they had no specificity to be useful in any way. Additionally, these supposed predictions were made by cherry-picking measurements of Earth's magnetic field from only just over a century of measurement and disregarding the vast majority of the remaining measurements. But nowhere are any of these supposed predictions derived from assuming a creation event. They are another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.